William, I, I think uh, a lot of us agree with what you've just said. It's time to get this country back on track. We have to worry about creating the economic capability to create those jobs so that you and others can continue to work, pay your taxes, do the things that you want to do to uh, send your kids to college. We need to do a number of things. Getting health care right is one of those, and that's why we intend to have this, uh, this vote. It's so easy to just say, stick to the status quo, stay with what you have. And by the way, with a two and a half trillion dollar system for health care, there are a lot of interests that would like us to stay with the status quo. It's time to change. You're an example of why. Let me ask you about a, a couple of members. By the way, your count today, firm votes, where is it at this hour as we speak to you at 817 Eastern Time? Uh, Steve, by the end of today, we will have had the majority that we need to pass this legislation. But right now? You know, there were, I guess what I'm asking, how many are, are considered undecided or uh, undeclared? It's a small number. It's a very small, a small number. Some of the members have not said no. A number are saying we're, we're still looking. And what we know is that we are very, very close, but that we feel very confident that when we come to the vote, the votes will be there. It's tough. These are, these are big decisions. It's like a vote to go to war. No one takes it uh, lightly. We all consider what, what's at stake. But I do believe that with the change that this will bring, people will feel that we are confidently putting this country back in the right direction, taking it back to the right direction. Let me ask you about a couple of members since you're part of the leadership. Uh, your colleague Loretta Sanchez, will she support the bill? I hope she will. I, I believe that at the end of the day most of the California delegation will. Uh, Marion Barry of Arkansas? Marion Barry is a good member from Arkansas. I, I believe that he'll see the importance of this. I'm hoping he will. John Tanner of Michigan? John Tanner, retiring member, smart, fiscally understands this country's needs. Uh, I'm hoping he'll be there. Kathy Dahlkamper from Pennsylvania. Kathy, Pennsylvania, uh, important state. She understands the need to get the country back on track. She's very concerned about some of the issues of, in, re in regards to abortion. I think she'll find that this bill takes care of all those needs, including making sure that we don't spend any federal money on abortions. But she is emblematic of a number of freshmen worried about re-election and in a tough race, you in know, a tough district. You know, Steve, most of the people I've spoken to, and I've spoken to every one of those that you've mentioned, they don't mention to me the, the re-election. They, they talk to me about what they're hearing from their constituents, how we'll, we'll, we'll take the country forward faster. And most of them are trying to make sure that they can go back and be true representatives of their district. Um, it'll be a tough vote for a number of them. But my sense is that they're more weighing how this will affect the people in their state and in their district and then make a decision based on that. Congressman Bart Stupak of Michigan has really led. He said that he had up to a dozen votes, although one of those, Congressman Carney of Pennsylvania, now saying he will support the bill. But do you, at the end of the day, think that Congressman Stupak will vote against the bill because of the abortion language? Steve, there's, if there's someone who wants to vote yes on uh, health care, it's Bart Stupak. And I know that he's continuing to have conversations with the Democratic leadership and the president, seeing if he could get there. Whether he gets there or not, I don't know, but I know that he's someone who genuine, genuinely would like to vote yes. If you could have changed every anything over the last 14 months, either the language in the bill or the way it, the House members went about it or the timeline that you went about health care, what would you have changed? I would have said to the, uh, the country, we need to reform the system. My solution would have been Medicare for all. One, because you talk to today's seniors and they'll say, it's helped, it's worked. In fact, we had a lot of seniors going out to these town hall meetings in August saying, tell the government to keep its hands off of my Medicare. And of course, Medicare is a government administered system for health care. You still get a private doctor, private hospital, but it's administered through the federal government. That's, by the way, what a lot of Republicans are calling a government-run system. Medicare is essentially a government-run system. Because Medicare has worked so well, and those who claim that it's going bankrupt don't recognize that, Medicare has life well beyond any private insurance, health insurance company. And Medicare doesn't, uh, on any given year, increase your premiums by 40, 60, 100 percent. And so what Medicare does is it takes care of our oldest and our sickest, and it continues to do so, and it's never stopped. It's a great system. That's why seniors love it. And if we had said to the American public, we're going to do for you what we've been able to do for seniors, I think we would have had a lot more success in moving forward. It's very similar to the discussion about the public option. Many of us believe that we should have fought to make sure that there was real competition in the private for-profit insurance marketplace. Have a system similar to Medicare that would guarantee that Americans would have a choice 
to be able to comp the insurance companies would have to compete, really compete, to see who could offer the best policy to Americans for health care insurance. There's a piece this morning in the New York Times about your colleague and the speaker, Nancy Pelosi from California, saying that uh, she had a meeting with the president in January along with uh, Harry Reid, the Democratic leader in the Senate, and the essence of it was she told the president, if we're going to put our necks on the line, you need to as well. Is that a fair assessment of, of what happened over the last few months? What the words were that she used, I don't know, but I, I know she said, we've got more than skin in this game, and this is for the public. We have to convince the public that all these rumors about socialized medicine, government takeover, death panels, all of those things that we've now shown and, and seen are not true, require the president to get as involved as possible. And, and I believe the president was intending to, and certainly now he has. Next is uh, David joining us from Pittsburgh. Good morning, Independent Line. David, go ahead, please. We'll try one more time if David is there. We'll go to Margaret from Union City, Pennsylvania, Republican Line. Good morning, Margaret. Good morning. Go ahead, please. Uh, Margaret, do me a favor. Turn the volume down on your television set. Otherwise, we're going to get an echo, and we'll have to move on to somebody else. Pennsylvania, Republican Line. Margaret, you still with us? Yeah. Okay. Good morning. Turn the volume down. Go ahead. Uh, yes, I'd like to know how this bill is going to affect the baby boomers that don't qualify for Medicare and can't afford independent health insurance, which runs about a third or half of their monthly income. Margaret, uh, thank you for the question because you, that population, whether you're in it or not, is the population that most needs the assistance, some form of uh, a road to get to insurance because the private insurance market doesn't give it to you. This legislation will, will establish this marketplace, this exchange where all the insurance companies will then be able to offer an insurance policy. Because it's an exchange administered by the federal government, we can make sure that, for example, that there are real consumer protections in it, that, that there are minimum benefit levels, and that there are, for example, caps on how much an insurance company can charge you for any type of care you get. We can make sure as well that they don't uh, discriminate against, against you for pre-existing conditions. The reason the insurance companies will participate with all those constraints on that unscrupulous activity is because they get, they're going to get access to 32 million new customers. And so by doing that, we're able to lower the price that they would otherwise charge you. You will have access, if you're in that population, to an insurance policy that will give you pretty decent coverage. I won't say great because it's still expensive, but it's a lot better than what you can get right now and for a lot less money. You can't do it otherwise because the insurance companies don't want your business. They want to be only in they want to get only large pools of people so they can spread their risk or they want to get only very wealthy people or very healthy people. And so you have to have a pool that you're part of. 32 billion people so that you can have access to the health insurance. That's what this is all about. It's trying to make it so that you give the insurance company, since we're going through the private market, an incentive to want to get your business, 32 million Americans. At the same time, you tell them, ah, but it comes with a catch. You have to provide minimum level of benefits, preventative care. You can't charge too much. You can't charge them forever. And you can't tell them, oh, because you have acne, you're not insurable. Because you ha you were a victim of domestic violence, it's a pre-existing condition, you're not insurable. Those two examples I just gave you are exam true examples of what insurance companies have used to deny people access to health insurance. The uh, soundbite that got a lot of attention yesterday, Drudge posted it, uh, your colleague Elsie Hastings, and John has this Twitter comment when he said, we make the rules up as we go along. That from the, uh, the House Rules Committee yesterday. Well, what he was uh, talking about is that in the Rules Committee, they try to have a very open system of debate because in the Rules uh, Committee, you decide what legislation will get to the floor and possibly become law. And so they try not to have a lot of constraints. For example, on the floor of the House, I'm limited on how much time I get to speak. In committee, my committees, I'm limited in the amount of time I get to speak. In the Rules Committee, they are very open. And so they essentially can decide, we'll, we'll debate forever or we'll only debate for a minute. It's very open, and I think that's what Elsie was talking about, is that in the Rules Committee, that's the last gate you pass before you actually put legislation that could change the lives of 300 million Americans. And so they open up the gate to real vigorous debate in the Rules Committee. We had only one bill before us, but it went for eight or nine hours. That's because you want to 
put aside some of the rules that constrain debate so you can have as vigorous a discussion about what legislation should get to the floor before it becomes law. So the gap comes down at 1 o'clock, technically the earliest that you can...